so for me, going into healthcare was, um, it was like a no brainer in a way because my practice was, is always engaged in being with people and working with people. Welcome to Hack Circus. This week's guest is Sarah Smiz, an artist I first came across when I was doing a TED talk in Sheffield, TEDx I should say, let's get it right, and she was the live drawing artist, so she was sort of standing uh, near the stage with a large piece of paper drawing things, cartoons based on all the things people were saying in their talks, it was so cool. But Sarah's like way more interesting than that, she's not just a live drawing artist, she is, well, recently she's retrained as a radiographer, which is impressive enough in itself, but you also need to know that a couple of years ago she became very seriously ill and subsequently decided that she was, yeah, she was going to retrain and do, and you can find out all about her story on her blog, which is uh, smiz.wordpress.com. And it's really interesting and really philosophical. This is the other thing about Smith. She's a, she's really a philosopher. She's very, um, very wise beyond her years, really. She's still very young. And not only did she become a radiographer, she, she's recently been awarded Radiography Student of the Year across the UK. And she's, in separate news, been awarded a full scholarship for a PhD in art and medicine. So she's doing this, it's it's you know, a medical PhD, which she's involving creative practice. And we talk about that a bit in this episode. So she's incredibly inspiring to me. And I think you're going to feel the same way once you've heard what she has to say. One of the great things about Sarah is that she's incredibly positive. She's had a lot of trials and tribulations in her life, but she's always smiling. She's the, the most joyful person to be around. Whenever you see her, you come away just feeling really good. She's, she's like a ray of sunshine. And it's easy to forget that she's been through so much in her really short life. So uh, it was a real privilege, actually, to be able to spend some time talking to her. And um, if you do enjoy this episode, please ha- go to iTunes and give us a quick star rating. It only takes a second to click on those. If you have more than a second, please do a little review as well. That really helps more people to find the show and subsequently for me to get sponsors and so and so on and be able to carry on doing this for a while if you hate itunes i know a lot of people do you enjoy telling me about that then just just tell somebody about the show just to, the next time the subject of podcast come up mention it to somebody word of mouth really helps too all right let's start Now it's Sarah Smiz, but it's also just Smiz. And presumably, you you weren't born Sarah Smiz. <laughs> it's a great question. Yes, uh, I'm I'm Smiz, but um, my real name's Sarah Smith. So you'd mm. never find me ever online uh, if yes. you put my name in. And uh, Smiz originates from when I wanted to be a rapper, uh, and uh, Smizzle rhymes with everything. And um, and then I used to do graffiti, um, so Smiz was my tag, and then I've, it's just stuck with me for sixteen years. <laughs> so cool! I love that you've, done, you've already introduced some of your like surprise creative outlets that no one might know about. Yeah, because so the one of the great things about so many great things about Sarah, but one of the great things is is that you do have this breadth of creative output and expertise and experimentation. And it's, yeah, it's a load of really cool stuff. Like, you you know, you're known for your, the way I came across you was from live drawing events, which is which is really cool, really exciting. And it's really fun seeing the way that you bring the talks to life for your cartoons and stuff. But then as you say, you, you kind of have this background in graffiti and rapping and you do comedy and you do sort of poetry and like, you, you know, you do a lot of writing. Yep. So, so have you always just been like a prolific creator? <laughs> It sounds like you have. <laughs> I guess I always remember I had a lecturer that said, you know, you can't you can't be critical of something if you've not made a hundred of it. And oh, I took that yeah. for real. So at the time I was making these photo collages. 
So I made a hundred photo collages and at the end, I didn't, still didn't know how I felt about them. And it's, and he was like, why have you made so many? And I was like, <laughs> you said you need to make a hundred. And he was like, no, I think I've always, I've been influenced by films and, and reading about people's lives. I just love people's stories. And um, one, I'm basically completely self-taught going into like academia or art. Um, so I used other people's lives to sort of copy what they do and everybody seems to be doing a million things so um, I felt like that was the way and I just everything interests me I think which is a downfall as well I think sometimes because it's hard to focus sometimes. It makes you a perfect person to draw talks and things like that to be at things. <laughs> yeah yeah I lost that is like the dream job because I get to learn about so much and you know and then at like dinner parties or whatever I'd be like oh well I drew this talk where they talk <laughs> about this and uh, it makes me seem really knowledgeable but really I've just uh, learned about how somebody else's methodology or process works yeah it's really cool. I find that I always found that at school like when I was revising drawing stuff always help me remember I feel like it really helps oh yeah and um, when I switched to radiotherapy and oncology I had not been in school for like proper school for like I don't even know like five six years seven years and uh, I totally forgot how to do sciencey like stuff because mm. in art you don't you just make work you don't need to revise per mm. se um so I copied my peers um and basically what they do they they'd write out the notes or copy and paste them on the computer and print them out and look at them so I did that for like the first month and it was not working out for me like I was getting like low two ones which is fine you know it's not about <laughs> the mark but I was like I don't understand what I'm doing wrong. And then I realized it's because I wasn't stay, staying true to how I work. And literally, I started drawing my notes. And I went from getting, you know, 62 to literally 100%, which was like mm -hmm. in... Say, I couldn't believe it, but I and I wondered what it changed. And I realized it's just the learning process and, the, yeah, the visual element of it. <laughs> You just mentioned that you've recently, well, fairly recently, well, not changed completely, but you've you've kind of embraced a new area of the world, which is um, <laughs> which is medicine. And that I think on your blog you've said that that's sometimes that's surprising to people that they don't really realise that there are all these connections with being artistic and creative and being being medical. Yeah, yeah, I, it, this fascinates me as well. Um, there's a long history. It surprised me because there's a massive history between art and medicine and healthcare and yet now we've got to you know the 21st century and it's all technologically advanced and stuff and we've seemed to become more about uh i don't know even though we're supposed to be more collaborative um we've ended up becoming a lot more like specialist and in a way this has hindered collaboration or seeing interdisciplinary practice more um so for me going into healthcare was um it was like a no-brainer in a way because my practice was, was always engaged in being with people and working with people. So it wasn't a jump per se to me. The, the way to study and the amount of studying is a jump. Mm. Um, but the process and the reasoning behind it and the practice of giving good care and making the pathway better and uh, using all these creative methodologies uh, of is really important and um, I want to try and make this more prominent and maybe we can be push medicine more in in, in that way using uh, more kind of creative methodologies as well as qualitative and scientific ones yeah that seems like it would be really positive because it would well it would attract a different a different kind of person or a person who might not who might be have so much to give to medicine and not think of themselves as being good because of things like if you're taught that you're not good at like academic learning or something and you don't realize that you can learn visually or, or kind of learn creatively or through caring or other things yeah absolutely like um I one of my things that I do is I'm trying to teach um healthcare students that you can reflect so reflection is a vital tool and you have to do it as part of your license in whatever you do whether that's being a doctor 
radiographer, nurse, etc. Um, because critical reflection is needed to push things forward and make your practice better. And, and um, you know, you can point out any um, flaws or what you do well as well. And it's re- taught really badly in a way because it's like, oh, you should have a reflection about you know, caring for a patient. You should have a reflection doing this. And it becomes this very tick box Mm. thing. And then you have these really dull uh, reflection cycles. But really, reflection is such an amazing tool where you can have this brilliant criticality which can make change. And uh, and I realized uh, drawing comics really helped engage it and it helped you edit your reflection down and it's, it made me want to do reflections and it made the e portfolio a lot more nice to look at too. Um, so I'm trying to show healthcare students now that you can use um, creative reflection because it uses tool like empathy as well, which sometimes I feel because of the tick box, mm-hmm. um, you kind of lose the essence of why you're doing the reflection in this first place to learn from it as well. Yeah, and when you were saying about the, the comics side of it, I was just thinking maybe one thing that comics are really good for is um, communicating emotion really clearly. And that's something that you can get away, you know, get across straight away with a picture and that covers all cultures and all languages and absolutely yeah Yeah. and um we're seeing a massive rise in like it's called graphic medicine now and it's really cool because i'm like yes (laughs) coming in at the right time and i start i think it sort of got started by somebody called doc to Ian Williams and uh, he did this book called The Bad Doctor and it's this whole comic about being a GP and he hosts a conference and he has a blog about it and uh, the blog reviews other people's comics and um, there's a lot of increase in both um, medical students and uh, actual patients um, using comics to get across their experience and it's fantastic because like it's exactly what you said, neuro exam. Like if you was just to write it, it's completely, it's just bland, there's nothing there. But when you see it in these brilliant, simplistic, black and white um, comic things, you realize the uh, tension and the emotion there and, and this build up for both the patient and the and the um, healthcare professional in that moment, like what that diagnosis is leading to, it's really cool. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, because I mean, so much of medicine is is emotional for people, isn't it? Like everything, everything about it, really. It's like it's, yeah. that's what it's that's what it's powered by. And I can see why you'd be attracted to it as somebody who's interested in people's emotions and like what makes people tick and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I had uh, issues when I was training in radiotherapy um, because I missed being an artist side being able to be so free Mm. in the like creative thing and then I thought once I'd gone back to this PhD that I've just begun combining both art and healthcare together that you know I'd be like yeah it'd be great but now I miss being a radio therapist as well because I miss that kind of connection with patients in that um, environment in that moment as well which I didn't think I would I that's why I enjoyed but I didn't think I would miss it but I do so I'm technically a qualified radio radio therapist very piece of radio therapist um I also surprisingly won um radio therapy student of the whole UK so I pick up my (laughs) award next month in London um which is strange because I'm this like weird art person right um who uh I don't know like I just feel like if the society was going to choose anybody it's like I'm very honored that they chose me because I never thought they would actually choose somebody like me but the problem is now people interview me and they go so where's your first job placement and I'm like oh I'm doing a PhD (laughs) I'm not actually in like a proper radiotherapy job (laughs) and they're like oh so you're not going to go back into clinical but actually what I'm working on right now is I hope that the work will um, change clinical practice so I'm still working in a clinical environment but I'm just not working in that same kind of radio therapist uh, position so I'm not delivering any radiation but I'm still part of the radio therapy uh, narrative and changing um, the actual service I hope and my research 
at the moment is uh, the, my original proposal is to use creative practice to um, with patients and their experiences of breast trunk edema after breast cancer okay. treatment. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, 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 very under-researched area, but it carries these massive, massive, massive quality of life issues for these patients um, to the point where they can't even hold their children um, because it hurts too much. Mm. But they're not often not consented that they're going to have this side effect. They're always consented about the arm lymphedema, but never the thoracic one. Um, and then as healthcare professionals working with these patients were not taught about it either so mm -hmm. my colleagues didn't know about it I didn't know about it and um, some nurses don't know about it um, patients I've spoken to even their oncologists might acknowledge it but they just they're not interested in that side effects because they're just you know it's all about the cure per se but breast cancer patients are our biggest group of survivors and they live the longest um, so it's really important that we get survivorship right because, you know, what's the point in saving life if it's not a good quality of life? Cause there's a big difference between surviving and living. And so um, it affects 20.5% of all women that go through breast cancer. So it's 50, around about 52,000 people um, in the UK a year that get diagnosed and mm -hmm. so you know it's around about 11,000 women a year that will get this side effect and they're being <clears throat> uh, sort of invisible in the mm -hmm. system almost and uh, and a lot of the little bit of research that does exist is um, that you know they feel very let down by the fact that they never got told that they it, there was this uh, chance and then because it took them so long for it to get recognized and it made them feel like they were going mad or it has this anxious anxiety there that you know maybe the cancer's back or the treatment mm. didn't work and mm. stuff like this and it becomes very blasé in practice because you go oh well, it's just a side effect it will go away or you know oh it's you, you know it's just normal and by us saying it's just normal we don't really do anything about it so I feel like creative practice is going to be able to use and these people's stories and their experiences and give it weight uh, because I find, you know, a lot of qualitative scientific methodologies such as just, you know, interviewing people. It's great. Uh, but I find science then just takes that great interview that is rich with these details and flattens it back down mm -hmm. so i want to make sure that we don't flatten and um, this and i think creative practice is going to be a great way in the meantime though i'm going to use all these methods to sort of look at the system and these tensions between the difference in healthcare methodologies and artistic methodologies and how we can use these better to make better service improvements in the long run This episode is sponsored by James Jeffrey's company Shed Code. James and I were residents at the Sight Gallery in Sheffield in 2012, which is amazing because it was so long ago, as part of the Happenstance Project Residency Scheme. We had fun with tweeting printers and Arduinos and drawing machines and loads of stuff like that, and were generally troublemakers on the Sheffield art technology scene for a few months which is great fun. James is interested in collaborating on interesting projects. He specialises in doing stuff with data and he's recently been working with the Bureau of Investigative Journalism building an API for their crowdsourced data on drone strikes, BBC R&D creating interactive stories on the BBC Taster platform and the London Philharmonic Orchestra creating a searchable archive of their historic performances. If you'd like to hire James or have a chat about a project you can send him an email james at shedcode.co.uk or find him on twitter at james jeffries j-a-m-e-s-j-e-f-f-e-r-i-e-s -E -E unusual spelling of jeffries look out for that he hasn't mentioned it here but james is also really interested in trains and knows loads about railways and stuff like that um so just follow him anyway he's really interesting give him a shout on twitter he's a nice chap right back to the show what kind of keeps you going? You have this amazing 
sort of scope to your work where you even with your writing it's always very big themes it's it's a really great thing I think that you kind of I wish more people were like that (laughs) (laughs) um I it's strange you know artistic practice is quite intuitive isn't it and sometimes it's really hard to verbalize exactly what your influences are or how you work or why you choose to do certain things Mm -hmm. um I've always, from as long as I can remember, uh, considered myself. I realized when I first read Karl Marx that I was a Marxist, uh, when I, and I read it when I was like 15, 14. And I was already a Marxist, but never read Karl mm-hmm. Marx. And I was like, this is like my thoughts, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think my upbringing um, were, was very... Um, I don't really know the right word, but... Um, super working class so uh, you know repressed um, by the system in a way mm-hmm. uh, and you're from Doncaster right yeah, yeah. <laughs> the donks the donks yeah <laughs> um, you know brought up in a single parent family you know my mum just has very bare minimum job where you know minimum wage doesn't cover anything that you need to live off uh, and I've always felt that my the people in my area you know we were at a disadvantage and the school I went to it's changed now because it's an academy but when I was there it was always in special measures and like 12 of us went to university and I ran I realized when I got to university that that was like most people came like everybody went to university where they came from Mm. um I don't know how me and my friends got there just ended up being I think at the time there was a lot of good labour policies about getting us kids to university Um, and I don't know I just felt like art could be a tool to make people think to help influence and change things I don't think art can influence policy per se I wish it could Um, but then I don't know if that should be art's role either but I do believe art has the potential to make people think and change and feel something which then can make them change their mind. And so, yeah, I've always made work with like some sort of underlying meaning to it. it, it that's usually on like a power. It's, it comes down to power most of the time, these power relations. I realised as well. I chose the one of the most middle class C areas to do it in as well. I was like, oh yeah, do it through art. And then I realized the art world was very yeah. sort of elitist yeah, in weirdly. itself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, damn it. Um, um, which has been awesome because then I wanted to figure out how the art world worked. So I went and worked in New York. I got really lucky and I got an internship with the most amazing gallery in New York called Postmasters. They uh, represent amazing new media artists uh, and um, social, socially engaged uh, practices. And uh, yeah, and I was able to see how they work because they're like they're really interesting because they're not like on the periphery in a way so they're not bitter because yeah. you know, people yes. get clusters being bitter when they critique the system mm-hmm. um which is you know problematic in itself mm-hmm. so they're like well in there but they're also being like why and we why can't we change the system and um so and they just they could probably make more money than they do but they refuse to do that because they're committed to showcasing art that can change uh, or is committed to saying something and I love that so it gave me a great I don't know if it was good for me in the long run because I was like yes I want integrity too um so um it was fantastic to be able to see how that art world works and that it's actually really difficult to have say something and be well integrated in it as well yeah yeah I, maybe this is an obvious point, but have you felt like an outsider trying to do things like going into, like you say, going into the art world, which is very middle class and very kind of, yeah, you meet a lot of people who are mysteriously independently wealthy and things like this. It's like, <laughs> how are you living? How did you buy that enormous piece of equipment? Um, <laughs> it's very weird. Maybe medicine's similar, I don't know. Do you find medicine's very middle class too? Yes. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yep, um, it's amazing. Um, it astounds me. Just and the more I go through life, the more I realize just how 
hard it is for people to jump these social class boundaries mm -hmm. and also what our position influences what we make and what we do in our opinions. The problem with healthcare is that it keeps changing the boundaries so it, it needs people from more backgrounds because it's treating people from every background. Mm -hmm. So you need your workforce needs to represent who you're treating. But it's so fiercely competitive that people don't acknowledge the investment that's needed at the school level or you can't compete with somebody that's gone that whose parents have paid for them to go to um you know Uganda for a, a gap year to mm -hmm. work and do some healthcare stuff there and then you might have five A's but they've done that so they're going to go with them mm -hmm. yeah it's for I have massive issues with the higher education system across the board when it comes to using people's A levels and when I did radiotherapy because it's more of an allied healthcare it's more down that way I thought oh we'll be fine but then mm -hmm. there was like I think like five percent of us that you know who were uh, just doing it from the background that I'm from mm -hmm. and whose parents weren't paying for everything. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, because the NHS bursary doesn't give you enough to live off right. as well, so that's problematic. Right. Yes, so you need uh, financial support to be able to continue through mm. because you have to do so much placement that it's really hard to get a part-time job on top of that. Right, oh, God, mm. yeah. Yeah, it's a trap. Yep, so mm. there are all these systems are just... They like loop on themselves and yeah. carry on, and then just really hard for people to make that jump onto it. Yeah. So, how, do you think one of the ways that you've achieved it is just by working every hour God sends? If people say I've got an amazing work ethic, but I, I often feel very lazy. Well, yeah. I think that's why. I think that's a classic thing. <laughs> like you think you'll never, you'll never feel like you've done enough. <laughs> 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 Wait, <laughs> <laughs> till three in the morning writing essays. Your Twitter account is where I'm getting most of this from, by the way. But I think it's it's partly work ethic and partly just the number of things that you've taken on, I suppose. That, you know, to, to honour them properly, you have to do this much and you can't get away with not learning things if you're doing a degree in a medical <laughs> subject. You have to do it. <laughs> but it's taking it seriously, isn't it? Absolutely. I think, yeah, no. My mum's always told me, you know, work hard and be nice to people mm -hmm. and uh, I think uh, uh, I like to do that and when in art it never feels like work it's it you know and I made sacrifices in the past which maybe on reflection I shouldn't have made uh, but I've got a second chance to not repeat that um, but it's uh, never felt like sacrifice at the time mm -hmm. and uh and I try and do the same in in my healthcare studies. The trick I find is using these creative ways so it's really enjoyable or using what you do to help it. So um, for revising, I made a Twitter revision group for radiotherapy students. So I thought if I'm making it, I can help other people do it at the same time. And if I'm already on Twitter doing 100 tweets an hour or whatever, <laughs> um, I might as well do some work on there as well. And it worked really well because it was like that kind of interactive learning. So it's stuck in and I got to learn a lot and I got to meet people and hopefully help them out too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm always trying to figure new things out in the process of when I'm doing all the work. But it was hard especially in my studies, because I was doing that, and I was, like, kind of unwell, and then I was doing my freelance work on top of that. Mm. So it was it was hard. <laughs> Have you managed to take your foot off the pedal a little bit um, since you started your PhD? <laughs> it seems like a funny question, but <laughs> after the complete change of careers and the, <laughs> doing loads of freelance work and everything else at the same time, or, or is, it, is it worse than ever? <laughs> What's the situation at the moment? I'm worried yeah. about you, Smith. <laughs> um, I, I was great. I took four months off, so I finished in June early June and I went straight to the States where I went back to my roots of working for the YMCA and uh, basically I gave two like art workshops with people of all ages for oh, two and a half months mm -hmm. and they pay for your accommodation, I get fed, I get paid pretty well so I love it because I get to meet 
all these amazing people. It's from people of all backgrounds, uh, you know, the inner city kids mm. to doctors and stuff. So it's great. So did that, and then I went to Hawaii and up the West Coast. So yeah. I felt very relaxed when I came back. Good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm just re-establishing my practice again now because it's so full on the past three years Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm not doing anything now because well I can sort of get up when I want to get up and I can stay up as long as I want to now and my days are like free for me to do things and I find it very unnerving so yeah at the moment I'm in this spot where I'm like I'm gonna take every opportunity I can so I go to a lot of lectures right now like Mm. even lectures that aren't for me I'm pretty sure I just turn up to and I'm like oh I'll I'll learn something new and I'm trying to re-adapt back to the art language Mm. um because I've got a little bit health carey I think yeah yeah yeah. do you do you find people tell you to slow down and then you feel like but this is what's giving me the energy is doing all these things (laughs) does that does that make sense to you when I fell sick Um, I realised that I'd sort of built my reputation on being able to do a thousand things. Mm. Um, And then I couldn't literally get out of bed. It was like one of the worst things that have ever happened to me. I can't even explain just like how... How I couldn't, I couldn't even watch BBC iPlayer because it was like, oh, you're sick, just watch Netflix. And I couldn't even do that. I just didn't... I just couldn't focus. And... um, and I, it gave me kind of a bit of an identity crisis because, like, I didn't know who I was outside mm-hmm. of the work that I do. And, uh, and why would you want to work with me if, uh, if I can't do a thousand things, if I can't be dedicated to it? So I try and make it so that I'm working, but I'm also allow myself to have some downtime mm. as well. So the PhD is offering me a little bit of that. I don't know whether I should say that on a recording because <laughs> apparently PhD is supposed to be the time when you do the most work in your life. Well, it is for a normal person, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you have to take into account all the things you've managed to do so far, which is quite extraordinary. Oh, my gosh. It, you have to see the movie. What's it called, though? I, Daniel Blake. Right, yes. And I feel like there's a blog post brewing oh, good. up inside me about it. Like, it's awful. So I, <laughs> I'm quite lucky in the sense that when I finished art school in 2010, I um, had to sign on, of course, mm-hmm. for like a month and a half. And I'd gone to America for like four months before I came back. And this is before they switched all the rules. So now if you're under 25, you don't get housing benefit. You have to, you know, back, live back home. And they're even saying, like, graduates can't really have it like, and things like this. So it's really problematic. But obviously, you know. And um, I always remember coming back from America and I said, they were like, oh, have you... I said, oh, I've been away. And they're like, why were you away if you've not got a job? And I said, well, no, I was working in America. And I was like, but it's finished. It was a temporary contract. And then they're like, why did you take a contract that was temporary? And I was like, I was like, it was going towards my career. Anyway, they made me fill out this form. They said, well, because you've been out of the country for more than two weeks, you have to fill out this form. And I was like, and I read, and the first couple of questions were like, why did you come to England? And I was like, well, I was born here. I said, I think this is the wrong form. And she said, no, you've been out of the country for two weeks. You have to fill it out. And so now you're an immigrant. I was an immigrant. And it asked me, like, why I decided to go to England. Uh, and what, how did I get to England the first time? And then I was, I was born here. And then they're like, why did you choose to come to England? I was like, I had no choice, you know? And then it asked me, like... The worth of the things, my possessions, uh, everything. And it was so... The language it was written in was awful. And that was, like, before it was really bad Mm. and now. And um, they make you... They make you feel powerless. Like, you go and they say to you, why why have you not been applying for these jobs? And, like, you know, things that... The the point is, I'm, like, I wanted to work in retail for my, like put me on job I didn't really want to work in a call center because I hate answering the phone Mm. and they'd be like why it's not good enough um that you're not you know applying for 
the cleaning job or this job, you know, but even though I was still applying for jobs that were across the board in all different areas, and then they'd be like, if you don't apply for every single job you're eligible for, you know, we'll sanction you. And send you back to where you came from. Send you back to where you came from, we just don't guess that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they would make you feel really worthless. I can't <laughs> explain it enough. And I, Daniel Blake, it really like it makes you. F- if you're not angry when you not s- when you see that, I don't. I don't really know because this it goes to show how people live in right now, and I see it in my own community. And the increase in food banks as well um, shows just exactly how our safety net is becoming a seen as a privilege, even though people are and and they're demonizing these people, even though these are the people that are paid into the system for all their life to have the safety net and they've been made to feel awful about it. And I, yeah, it made me want to do something about it as well. So I don't know what I'm going to do yet, but I'm going to do something about it. It is a city and it's a type of place that when you're away from it, you miss it a lot. Mm. And because it feels so familiar, even though it's the city and it's got loads of stuff going on, you just meet people and and then they, you're like literally like two or three degrees separated from like people you know mm-hmm. all the time. So you can meet somebody in a pub and it turns out they, they'll know your friend. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love that about Sheffield and people are very giving here, which uh, I, I love as well. Mm-hmm. And you kind of have the best of both worlds because you travel a lot with your work as well. Well, you have done historically. <laughs> so you get to meet the international New York art community one week and then the next week you're back, back in Donk with your mum's beautiful dogs, which I have to mention because they're so cool. Does she still have them both? Yes. Oh, does. good, thank God. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's, there's, um, there's an Alsatian, uh, a German Shepherd, I should say, and, um, uh, and a Border Collie. And yes. they're both adorable. Oh, my God, I'm just in love with them. But she didn't call it Pixel, the collie. No, she said, she was like, I really want this dog. Will you support me in getting it with her husband? And I was like, yeah, if we can call it Pixel. <laughs> she said, yeah. I was like, okay, cool. So we get him. And then she's like, no, we're not calling him Pixel. She's like, it's called Finn. Finley, his Finley dog. So mm. he, he suits Finley more because right. he's like kind of cheeky. So mm. it goes with his sort of demeanor here yeah. right, right. <laughs> i know we still need to organize a border collie play day i know we totally do like um it's good that he's cheeky like yesterday I, was, I took my dog out and he's he just thinks he's a puppy so he's constantly trying to initiate play with other dogs even though he's like he gets into trouble for it all the time because he's so hyper and he's literally just jumping at them and punching them and stuff and there was another collie who was about the same age but um the owner was like Oh, he doesn't like to play. He never plays. He's rubbish. Um, and he just stood there next to my legs, and my dog was like throwing himself at this guy. And the guy was like mm, completely still. So if yours is more playful, it would be a good, a good he, mate. He gets very hyperactive, but he's actually very chill at home, which oh, is so I got yeah. the best of both worlds because we've had border collies before, and they mm. have been extremely hyper mm-hmm. you know but if you my mum's always like because he's very easy to wind up as well um <laughs> so sometimes i go home and i like to get him really excited and she's like you can get up with him all night because uh, i remember one night i'd left um a cake tin on the on the landing i should have taken it downstairs but i, I just couldn't be bothered to go downstairs i was like leave it on the landing because it remind me to take it downstairs and he got up in the night and, like, taken it off the uh, windowsill and deliberately rolled it to the stairs and then rolled it down the stairs. So it went ding, 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 ding. And then it, we got laminate flooring at the bottom. And my mum was like, Sarah! Because like, I've, like, wound him up and then left this cake tin there. The noisy toy. <laughs> yeah, he loves, he loves a bit of attention. <laughs> And that's it for this week. Yes, I've started doing an outro. I thought it was about time we stopped ending these episodes so abruptly. If you would like to get in touch with Hack Circus, uh, you can do so by 
tweeting us at Hack Circus. You can email editor at hackcircus.com. You can find us on Facebook, Hack Circus Podcast, and we're even on Snapchat as Hack Circus. And remember, the whole show is about going behind the scenes with creativity, so creative and inspiring guests every week for you. I have promised 50 episodes, and I'm sticking to that promise. It may be that some weeks I'm quite busy now. I've got a new show opening today, in fact, in, in Salford at the Lowry, so I am going to be quite busy. But if I can't get a guest one week, and I do have a lot lined up, but if I can't get one, what we might do is creativity clinic like we had last week. Get in touch and send any questions you have for the creativity clinic. Anything to do with, you know, getting creative, getting motivated, uh, practical stuff around funding or finding work or managing your time, anything like that. And as I say, if I don't know the answer, I'm sure I can find out some information for you. I'm really happy to do that. I really want to be able to help listeners as much as I can. I hope to hear from you soon. And either way, there'll be a new episode with a great interview, which I'm really excited about already next week. See you soon. <laughs>